Captains of Industry, brought to you by Airtel. Now, property as an asset class has been a focal point, especially in the post-credit crisis era. In some economies, like in South Africa, for instance, we've seen property outperform the main uh, all-share index of the JSC by uh, significant percentages and returns. And this has raised questions as to whether or not property is still the way to go as a safe haven investment and as an investment for a new kind of Africa. Banks are trying to make it easier to lend to new homeowners, but at the same time constrained by regulations, especially with the introduction of Basel III, for banks to be a little more fastidious in how they allocate capital into the broader economy. As Africa grows, some of these are questions and challenges that Frank Ireri is having to cope with as Managing Director of Housing Finance. Thanks for being with us. Now, you have a vision for this company to grow its market share from 35% to 50% in the near future. How are you going to address that and tackle that? Yeah, we actually have been addressing that um, over the last three years since we effectively um, put in place our current strategy. And it's predicated one around product innovation. Mm. For us, we spend a lot of time understanding what it is that is restraining so-and-so from converting from a rent uh, pair into a homeowner. Yeah. and then coming up with the necessary products to enable them to make that shift. The second is around the supply side in terms of housing supply in the market and the interventions and actual developments that we are doing ourselves across the country. Now the bulk of that is residential, although we also do do some commercial. Yeah. Um, those I'd say are really the two key uh, driving forces um, of, of this strategy of ours. It's basically create, create the market. Uh, expand the market and then play a big hand in it. Now, also, of course, we're very cognizant that competition yeah. is on the increase. Today, uh, mortgage finance is the flavor of the month. Yeah. And over 30 institutions in Kenya are now offering mortgage finance. Yeah. So naturally, to achieve that 50% uh, will become harder, but it is still within our vision. You've introduced innovations such as the property point, which is yeah. seen as a one-stop shop yes. for both the homeowner and also the, the developer. developer. How does it work? Yeah, how it works, in fact, we set it up first for the home buyer because we had a lot of people coming to us saying, please assess, please assess how much I can borrow. Right. And once you make an assessment, they then turn around and say, now please get me the house. Yeah. And we saw that as an opportunity. Now, since we didn't have the houses ourselves, we partnered with the various real estate agents in, in, uh, in Kenya who sell houses but don't offer finance. So it's really non-competitive. Mm and brought them into the property point under one roof. Mm. We then took that a step further with now the developers that we are financing. So as their developments are ongoing, we're actually selling them through the property point mm. so that you're bringing both the sellers and buyers together like in one marketplace and able then to assess what they can afford and then give them mm. the financing for it. We've even taken it a step further for developers by bringing in some of the key players in the property value chain. So paint providers, roofing tiles, cement companies, etc., right. who then come and also advertise within the property point and right. offer significant discounts to those developers that take up their products. Just in terms of the future, I mean, we've spoken extensively about monetary policy and we know that inflation is benign in yeah. Kenya at the moment, but there are concerns about whether people really do have disposable income and whether people should be making major investments in property and whether the market is right, the time is right, especially in the current international uh, economic order we live in. Recovery is very slow globally and uh, Kenya was particularly battered by a variety of forces as well. So. Kenya doesn't quite meet the African average for growth. Do you think that your views are overly optimistic for this market? No, I don't think so. And I have a lot of faith in the Vision 2030 um, blueprint. I have a lot of faith on the recovery we have made on the back of our post-election violence in the first quarter of 2008 and where we've reached now on the back of a coalition government. Mm. I have a lot of faith uh, now on the back of the new constitution going forward that we will achieve both our economic and political aspirations as a country. And of course there's the East African community which has oh, yes. also been uh, scrutinized and yeah. receiving a lot of media attention, but that provides a springboard into the rest of the region for housing finance. Yes. Um, what's your profile like within the region and do you have aspirations of being a pan-African mortgage financier? Yes we do, and I'd say in the medium term, in the next two to three years, would be a focus within the East Africa region 
and then beyond that, looking at a Pan-African entry um, as as housing finance company. Yes. Your leadership style. I mean, some look at you and you're young, you're astute, you're cosmopolitan, and they wonder, is the future in housing finance or elsewhere? Hmm, my career's coming to an end. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a very interesting question, because I'll tell you, for the better part of my career, I've had very clear three-year visions. And for the first time now, I've been here now almost four and a half years, I actually don't know what tomorrow holds. Yeah. I still enjoy very much what I'm doing. There's so much more that needs to be done. Yeah. So I'd say as long as um, I'm still welcome here and I'm still enjoying myself yeah. and adding value, because for me that's very important, right. then I will, I will stay. Personally, I do have public service um, aspirations, not elective, mm -hmm. um, but more in serving as, I guess, a technocrat or something, right. and also as a way of giving back. Because, again, I'm one of the fortunate right. uh, Kenyans who have been well-educated, I've worked for both multinationals, top local companies. Yeah. So there's a lot I know I can give back to this country, and I'd love to. Yeah. I think people often use the word added value loosely. What does it mean for you? Because you're very keen on issues of mentorship, especially within education. Yes. Yes. Added value to me, and in the sense of my current position here, is in the realm of our stakeholders. Am I adding value to our customers in terms of are we bringing in more customers, are we improving their connection and relationship with housing finance, with our shareholders, with our staff, with our regulators, mm -hmm. etc. Because the last thing I'd ever want is my success mm -hmm. uh, to lead then to my failure. Where you get to a point where you think you know it all, you, you, you start becoming the resistance to change itself yeah. and yet five years, six years earlier, the one who was driving it. Yeah. So I, I always pray and hope that I'd have the wisdom to know when it's time to step aside. Right. And I'm fortunate also I've got some very um, strong mentors and who tell me in the face, mm -hmm. Frank, it's time to move. I don't want you to make political comments and compromise your position in that way, but you, you talk about the wisdom to know when you've made your contribution and to step aside. And that seems to be a real weakness when it comes to African leaders yeah. in general. Yeah. Uh, people have long tenures in corporate service, long tenures in public service, and then we see some of our politicians jostling for power simply because they don't want to step down. And for the world looking at Africa as an emerging market, this issue of governance seems to be the biggest weakness of um, the African state of mind. Why mm. is that? Hmm. I don't know whether I'd Africanize it, but I think, um, I think as human beings, if one reaches beyond their wildest dreams, you'd find such tendencies when, when well, once you get there, I guess you're in, you're in such a state of shock that you actually don't want to leave yeah. that environment. Vis-a-vis, -vis, it is something you've aspired for, you've worked for, you deserve, you get, know how long to serve, and then step down. And someone like Bill Clinton, I mean, is a very good example. He was a young president, served his two terms, most powerful man on, on earth, and now he's doing, he's doing other things. Barack Obama will find himself in the same position, and hopefully he will have his two terms. Right. So I think it's his um, limited ambitions, um, in some cases also a lack of self-esteem, um, and insecurity. So when people get there, they just want to hang on to it. You mentioned the importance of those who've mentored you. Mm. What lessons have you learned from them? Oh, I've learned a lot. And it, this goes back, I mean, way back in my career. But there are several things. One is the value of teamwork. As a leader, there's one thing, and the higher up you go, one thing you realize, there's actually less than you, that you yourself can actually do. You need to rely on members of your team. I'm a Formula One fanatic, Ferrari specifically. And I always like to give examples of the pit stop. Yeah where you have about 10 people whose job is to get that car out, tires changed, fueled, etc., in about five to six seconds. Yeah. Now that takes real teamwork. The other is about humility, yeah. okay? And that just because you are a director or managing director or chairman, etc., it doesn't mean you know it all, yeah. okay? You're there, you have a position, you have a responsibility, but so do those that you are, that you are working with. Mm. So those are some of the two very good lessons that I've learned over time. 
The reason I'm mentioning this is that because you are uh, an honorary member of the Council of ISEC and yes, yes. their issues around skills development, mentorship come to the fore. And one of the biggest uh, limitations we have in Africa is not enough skilled Africans to lead Africa politically and to lead Africa mm. in corporate terms. Mm. And this also becomes the deficit that <coughs> impacts on the willingness of investors to bring their money into Africa because they just see this as mm. going to add to the costs of doing business. Mm. So from the lessons you've learned, mm. from the inspiration you've received, what are you doing to create a new breed uh, and a new generation of Frank Herreris? No, that's very true. And in fact, for me, one of the most defining experiences I've had in my life was through ISEC as a university student um, over 20 years ago. And also the exposure I got then and the privilege to go on a, a developmental ISEC uh, traineeship to Finland, mm -hmm. which also opened my eyes in different ways. Mm -hmm. And that is why when I left college, and, and sorry, and even during university, had two vocational jobs, summer jobs, uh, again through ISEC. And that's why I made a vow when I left that I will always give back to ISEC because I know what ISEC uh, did for me. So yes, I've served on ISEC Board of Advisors. I now uh, sit on the Honorary Council, etc. And it gives me a lot of pride to see the number of bright men and women mm -hmm. uh, coming out, and especially into corporate mm -hmm. Kenya. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think we have a big disconnect, and I'll talk specifically about Kenya, because corporate-wise, we have a lot of very bright and sharp um, mm -hmm. men and ladies. But politically is where we have our issues. And for the few corporate um, professionals have actually moved into the political jungle. Unfortunately, some of them have also gotten swallowed and consumed by whatever happens in there. I've never, have never quite really understood. But definitely, and especially with our new um, constitutional dispensation, there are a lot of, they are political, but have a lot of technical, um, technical responsibilities and experiences that are needed, especially at the county level. And I'm happy to see a lot of county professionals already getting together to start planning, one, the blueprint for their counties, and also to the type of leaders that they want. And I think 2012 and going forward, we'll see more corporate Kenyans getting involved in political leadership in this country. Now we've spoken about your vision for the company and your hopes for this country, and potentially a technocrat the next time I meet you. But what do you make about the future for Africa? We're talking about mm. African mega cities. Mm. Is that a pipe dream or a reality? I think it's a reality. I think there's a generational, there's a sweep taking place generationally. It's only a matter of time and probably within the next 10 years that I think the remnants of the um, yesteryears um, would have moved on to the next world mm. and we will see the sort of change that Africans yearn for. And you meet them all over the world, all over the continent, and everybody is just yearning for change. Everybody is just yearning to see the um, upliftment of their people mm -hmm. and to walk with pride as an African, you know? That is something I think we all yearn for. Yeah. Frank Ureri, Managing Director of Housing Finance, thank you for being our captain of industry tonight. Most welcome. It's all about Africans yearning for change, being part of that change, catalyzing the change in mindset, turning it into tangible dreams such as home ownership, making it affordable. It's not just about being part of Africa's development, but it's part of Africa's reconstitution. Frank Ureri, Managing Director of Housing Finance, with aspirations to contribute broadly in Kenya by taking on uh, responsibilities in public service, drawing on the technical expertise of running one of Kenya's premier mortgage financiers. You've been